Flight attendants, please prepare for takeoff. Stolen by Ehlers to Wheeler, back to Ehlers, scores! Kyle Connor has the Midas touch right now! Here's Patrick Laney. What a shot, wow. Exactly shoot, oh! Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. This is Tyler Escavel, and you're listening to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. I'm your host, joined by Mitchell Clinton of Jets TV and Paul Edmonds of 680 CJOB. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us here today for another episode. Uh, Mitch, we'll start with you. Obviously, we're into a one week of Jets training camp out of Bell MTS Iceplex. You have been perched from atop the exchange restaurant up there as of you, Paul. Mitch, what have you seen so far of camp, uh, you know, so far? Uh, it's been pretty cool to watch, actually, just in terms of, you know, the the level that a lot of these guys have gotten to. I mean, there's been some plays that have been made where, you know, everybody kind of looks over at each other being like, you know, it's it's a it's a January training camp and that guy just made that play. You know, it's looking like mid season form. Kyle Connor's hands look like he hasn't missed a beat. Um, and then you got guys like uh, Josh Morrissey, who I thought if you haven't listened to it or had a chance to listen to it, go to jets TV on the website and watch Josh Morrissey's uh, media availability from Friday uh, day five of training camp. I thought, that might have been one of the best ones of the entire week, just in terms of the stuff he talked about, about conversations in the off season with Blake Wheeler, about taking his game to another level and, you know, finding ways to increase his, the threshold of what he's able to do on the ice. So as much as that was probably one of the more recent things that happened uh, in training camp, that to me is something that's going to stand out for, for a while. I felt Josh Morrissey, and he admitted this, you know, took on a lot last year, especially at the start of the year. He's an alternate captain. He had just signed this big extension. And then, of course, you look at the blue line at, the, at that point of the uh, of training camp. You know, they had lost a bunch of guys. He took a lot on his shoulders. And he said it took him a while before he just kind of realized, you know, being consistent and being good at the, at the game that he brings to the table every single night is what's asked of him. So now that that's really his priority this year. And he feels by doing that, he's going to make everybody around him better. And that's really what that conversation with Blake Wheeler centered about. So a long way of saying there's been a lot of things that have stood out to me, but uh, the one that might stand out the most is the one that just happened. Yeah. And and Mitch, you mentioned Josh Morrissey, Paul, the next one goes to you. What do you make of the way Paul Maurice has balanced his defense corps? I think going into training camp, everybody sort of thought that Dylan DeMello was going to be on uh, the, the flank of Josh Morrissey at the start of training camp, but that hasn't been the case so far. It's a bit more balanced. He's got, uh, Paul Maurice has Dylan DeMello with Nathan Beaulieu on that third pairing. You know, what do you make of the way the defense has shaken out thus far? Well, Tyler, as you mentioned, that was the assumption, right? That it was going to be Josh Morrissey and Dylan DeMello, and then Forbort was going to be with Pionk. And then you were going to see the, I guess, the band ride together again, if you will, in Nathan Beaulieu and Tucker Pullman, who played so well in the qualifying series against the Calgary Flames last year, played together again. Well, that didn't happen. And what's happened now is you've seen, as you mentioned, Nathan Beaulieu with DeMello. Now you've seen Tucker Pullman elevated in the depth chart on the pairings with Josh Morrissey and Forbord and Pionk are the constant that we thought they were going to be. The reason for this, and Paul Maurice was asked about this yesterday, is it's a balance. They're trying to find a balance of speed and size on their blue line. They're trying to make sure that they've got maybe one guy that's a little bit more physical with a guy that can advance the puck and maybe jump up in the rush. That's not to say that they don't want all five working up in the unit and going as a five-man unit on the rush, but just maybe having the ability to have a defensive-minded defenseman first with an offensive-minded player. And this goes back for years in the history of hockey and how you've assembled this. He also mentioned that it was important to find that balance this year because he didn't feel there was going to be one individual or a pair that was going to play 25 to 27 minutes a night. So that means that everybody was going to get a chunk this year of not equal minutes, but around the same amount of playing time. Last year, Neil Pionk led the team in minutes played. Right behind him was Josh Morrissey. I think they'd like to shave some minutes off those guys this year and have Tucker Pullman play a little bit more. 
Nathan Beaulieu uh, play a little bit more. Dylan DeMello play a little bit more. And therefore, over the condensed and intense 56-game schedule, when you come out of it, presumably into a playoff spot, you still have these guys, your top guys, ready to go, and they're not fatigued. So I make a lot out of this. This has been thoughtful in terms of how they've rolled out their defense pairings, and it remains to be seen if it's going to work for them. But I think in theory, it's a very good thought to start. Paul Maurice said that he also wanted to make sure that these pairings go through the balance of camp and to start the season together to get some compatibility, some chemistry together, although they could change subject to injury, of course. Mitchell, the bottom six is uh, an area of the Winnipeg Jets roster that's been a bit of a juggling act. I mean, you have a lot of players, you know, that are coming up through the system that that need playing time in the National Hockey League to prove themselves. But it's it's kind of been a revolving door, and it, and it is that right now as well. And it, plus, you add Nate Thompson, who came in. He was a free agent signing. You have Trevor Lewis on a PTO. How do you see that bottom six shaking out? You know, that's a good question. And I know I've got... S- like Adam Lowry and Andrew Copper are two guys that seem to be attached, you know, as part of a, a real solid uh, checking line. And at the start of camp, it was Matthew Perot on that right wing. And then he, you know, after the first day was unfit to practice for a bit, he skated with the morning group. And actually Friday was the first time that he got back out there, but he wasn't back in that spot. That's where Mason Appleton was. And Mason Appleton, I think has, you know, really come on over the course of the last season or so. Um, showing what he's able to bring to that line, which is, which is a whole lot of speed. And he's not shy about going into corners either. It's similar to Matthew Perot. So I think they bring a lot of similarities. Um, I think, I think Trevor Lewis, as far as first impressions go, has been fantastic. And it's, it's crazy to see how he's coming in. He's a, he's a veteran guy coming into a training camp on a PTO. I think that's just the, the nature of the salary cap being what it is, but So he comes in, gets a goal and an assist in his first skate, which was the scrimmage on Wednesday. And his line with with Jansen Harkins, who unfortunately hasn't been on the ice the last couple of days after that scrimmage, after a goal and an assist, there was some chemistry there. So you think back to the the fourth lines that the Winnipeg Jets have had over really the last four or five years, you know, they've been able to, to play well. They just haven't really had the minutes. And Paul Evans was, was talking about, you know, the, the, the amount of minutes that Paul Maurice is trying to look at for the defensive pairs. I mean, you look at the bottom six, they're going to have to play a massive role uh, over the course of this so that your top end doesn't get into that 24 ish minute uh, realm too often. So I think, and this is all based on whether Trevor Lewis, you know, actually turns that PTO into an actual contract, but I mean, you're looking at the line rushes from from day five of camp. You got Pro Thompson Lewis as your as your quote unquote fourth line. And that's a lot of experience. That's a that's a trio that can bring a lot to the table. Thompson and Lewis can kill penalties. Cop and Lowry can kill penalties. I mean, if if your two penalty killer units jumping over the boards are Cop and Lowry, Thompson Lewis. I mean, that's that's a lot of depth. And then you all you've also got guys like Mason Appleton who's killed penalties. I mean. I think there's that bottom six can provide a lot for the Winnipeg Jets. And I mean, that's not even to say that, you know, Christian Veselina might be a guy that gets a look. CJC saw his first NHL action. Yona Luoto saw some NHL action last year. So you got some guys with, with some experience, maybe not the amount of games played, but I think depth wise, the Jets are in a great spot. Well, Mitch talks about that depth and, and the fourth line specifically. Now, there's only three spots on that fourth line, but there's definitely more than three bodies that could occupy that. How do you see Paul Maurice and Kevin Sheveldayoff shaping that taxi squad? Boy, that's tough. And Paul was asked about that today, Tyler. And there's a lot of configurations that you have to assemble in terms of how you're going to put it together. And it's going to be waivers eligible, waivers exempt, uh, entry-level contracts, um, I think veteran presence, rookies, what your status is. One thing Paul said today, he gave us a bit of a hint on Friday in his address, and that was he didn't want to see young players watching hockey, meaning that the young guys, if they weren't good enough to be on, say, the top 23 on your roster, that he didn't want them relegated to the taxi squad, even though they are practicing and playing, and inside the bubble, 
of the rest of the 23, he didn't want them outside kind of looking in and then having to kind of come in just to make another move if they were going to get into the lineup into the top 23. He'd rather see them playing at the American Hockey League level. So that gave us a bit of an insight on Friday as to that. But it's going to be really difficult, I think, for us to speculate on which way the organization is going to go when they are going to assemble that taxi squad. Based on what Paul said on Friday, I would have to tell you that there would be more of a veteran presence that would be on that taxi squad. But that's awful tough, too. I mean, if you have a guy that's not on an entry level, that's not waivers exempt, you pull him off the taxi squad to take a spot, then you have to send him back down if that player gets healthy again, he then becomes waivers eligible and you could lose that player. So this is brand new for the organization. I think they've got to navigate this with a lot of thought going into it. They will, of course, but this is something that they've never had to sort of navigate before. It's uncharted territory, if you will. So I think a lot of thought will go in before they actually assemble those four or six players, depending on how many they want. That's another decision. How many players do they want on the taxi squad? They could have four. They could have as many as six. That's another decision that goes into this as well. Now that we've gotten through the analysis portion of this podcast, up next comes an interview with Paul Stasny. Uh, I sat down with him at Bell MTS Iceplex in the bubble uh, for about 15 minutes. We covered a lot of ground in terms of, you know, he was one of the last players in the NHL to use a wood stick. That's part of the conversation. Some of his pandemic hobbies. But first, we get right to the hot button issue uh, of Louis Wheeler and how he was very disappointed that Paul Stasny chose Vegas over Winnipeg a few years back. So Paul put some water on those rumors. This is Nikolai Ehlers. You're listening to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Joined here on the Ground Control podcast with Jets center Paul Stasny. Paul, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem. Okay, so I do have one question that we need to get out of the way first. Uh, have you smoothed things over with Louis Wheeler? I know he was very upset when you left the first time, and he said he didn't burn your jersey, and he's happy that you're back. So have you talked to him? What's the relationship like between the two of you now? Yeah, we're on good terms. We're on good terms. I saw him uh, a couple of days ago after the quarantine was up, so I ran into him just for a couple of minutes there, and we're talking World War II history, so I think I'm on his good, I'm on his good books. But I called, I, I tried like kind of bluffing him with a question, and three days later, Blake texted me and tells me that Louis said I was wrong, and I guess I was wrong. I brought up something from World War One, so right now he's one up on me, and in, in, if we're counting the score. So I would imagine you both are history buffs, then. Yeah. Oh, I'm a huge World War II guy. I love it. And I, Wheels was telling me how Louis is just infatuated with it right now. So. Um, I don't know. There's just so much, you know, there's so much stuff going on. So I thought I'd stump him with something and little did I know I was wrong. <laughs> um, all right. So to over to the hockey side of things, just how does it feel to be back in Winnipeg here? Good. Good. I think uh, once we knew when we we're coming, I think the, the biggest kind of uncertainty was when are we going to come up here, especially, uh, you know, my wife and two kids and two kids being in school. Um, I think we're all excited. We just didn't know when, especially with the holiday season. So it was kind of tricky, but we, it turned out good where we came, um, you know, about half a week or a week before Christmas time into Christmas here in quarantine and uh, had a blast with it. And then now kids are back in school and, um, you know, everything's kind of smoothing out and getting back to normal for the season to start. And, you know, to me, you know, if my family's uh, in a good position, you know, I'll always make do. I'm never worried. And I think my wife's the opposite where she's always worried about me and never worried about herself and the kids. So I think that's why we're a good match. That's perfect. I, I know when the trade happened, you were very excited and you kind of talked about just how much you were happy it was Winnipeg. What was it about your experience here in 2018? You know, probably aside from the the run that you guys went on that was important to you and that really stuck with you. Yeah, it's just a good group of guys. I think it's a, a good mix of um, – guys that want to win you know a good mix of skill a good mix of of young guys with older guys and just a good blend you know and then um that's what you need now you, you got those young guys you got those middle-aged guys you know and then you got the older guys and so you can find different guys hanging out with, but everyone seems to get along everyone seems to enjoy it and um it just seems like a tight-knit group from when i was here you know a few years back to you know coming here now it seems like nothing's changed and uh obviously it just speaks from top down you know management wise and ownership wise to leadership on the team i won't classify you so i'll let you do it yourself you said young guys middle guys and veteran guys which group would you put yourself in yeah i'd be like the older guy obviously (laughs) you know when i I say young guys i'm probably talking like uh 
you know, 22 and under when I say middle guys, just, you know, anyone mid twenties and then older guys is anyone over and, and, and you know, anyone with kids or family, that's why I consider older guys. <laughs> I, uh, I was going to say, like, is there like a just a, a different like that dad bond that you have with the other dads on the team? Yeah, but yeah, but you just see it, you know, when you came in, when I came in the league, um, you know, I just remembered seeing how certain guys would go out, how certain guys would um, hang out after practice or on the road, you know, and the ones with kids had different priorities. And, um, you know, they're just you could tell they pick their spots a little bit. And I always, you know you never knew why and as you got older you realize like all right maybe you don't recover as fast and uh, maybe you're a little more tired home because you know you get home and no one cares you're a hockey player you're you know you're playing with your kids and enjoying it and you know it's a whole other job so and it's also nice too i think it's also nice um you know in times like these sometimes we we get too caught up and, and just so focused on our own lives and being a hockey player that you know when you do have kids um you realize there's more to life than, than just the hockey player and people, you know, your kids don't know you for the hockey player. They know you for your dad. And, you know, when you're done playing, no one's, you know, I look at my dad, I look at other players, dads, like when they're done playing, you know, these generation kids don't even know that my dad, you know, was a great hockey player. They just know him as a person he is. And I think as you come older, you come to realize that and you just come to appreciate, you know, just being in the moment and enjoying it. Cause you never know when it's going to be gone. The thing that strikes me about you, and you talked about this in your media availability, is just sort of being a you know old school and you know humble is probably a word that's been used to describe you. Where does that come from? I know it just obviously comes from maturity and just years of seeing and doing what you do, but there's something within a person that sort of dictates that and and how people go about their business. Where do you think you learned that? Um, I don't know. I've just like uh, you know my my dad and I were talking about it. You know, he said it from like a young age. I've always been like an observer, I think, because I'm the youngest of four. So I got to learn from, you know, I always think being the youngest, there's, there's pros and cons, obviously. But to being the youngest was easy because um, we're all close. You know, my oldest sister was, you know, we're all within five years. So I could learn from her mistakes. I could learn from things. I could learn from my, my brother, you know, going to high school, playing junior hockey, college, different things like that. So to me, I, I learned what they did good, what they did bad. And then I've always kind of been like that. And I've always been a good listener, a good observer. And I just, I don't know. I just see what works. I see what doesn't work. And I like to ask questions, you know, and, and I don't know. If, I don't know if that's just kind of a trait that my dad has, you know, it's kind of passed down. And, you know, obviously as you get older, you realize, you know, how similar you are to your, to your parents or to the people you grew up with or the, you know, your closest friends. And, you know, you just take certain things from them. But, um, yeah, I just always feel like, uh, you never want to be, you know, that saying you never want to be the smartest guy in the room. Right. So you're, you're always growing, you're always learning and not just hockey, but just in life and just other aspects. And, and like I said, I've, I've never wanted to be one of those person that can only talk hockey and only knows hockey because, you know, one day hockey's not going to be there. And, and I grew up in that aspect that I never knew, um, I never planned on being a hockey player. I planned on going to college and getting an education because, um, yeah, I, I got a scholarship, and but it's just it's so hard to make the NHL. So that was never like a mentality the way I grew up. The way I grew up, you know, with my dad was, you know, you're going to play college, and if you're fortunate enough to play national hockey, you're fortunate enough to play. But, you know, very few guys can make a career off it. So you should never sit there and bank on that. You know, you always got to be prepared for something that might come. And so I've always kind of had that mentality where, you know, what's next or, you know, always expect kind of the unexpected. So what was the backup plan when you were going to college? What was something that piqued your interest? Uh, I don't know. Honestly, like um, my first two years, I just took like all electives because at Denver, you didn't have to declare for major till your, till after your sophomore year. So I just, I mean, I, I remember I had a lot of teammates that would do marketing or real estate or finance. And then, you know, after the first year, they, they transfer and do a new major. For, or for me, I was like, well, I don't know what I'm interested in. And then I think I, cause I only went two years at school and uh, I've always told myself that like when I'm done playing, you know, I want to graduate eventually and take summer classes, do online classes, you know, just to be a kind of good example to my kids. But, uh, I think when I do go back, I'll do finance. I've always like real estate and finance. I've always been two things that really stuck in my mind. Um, but real estate, I feel like, I don't know. I just learned, you kind of learn, you know, when, <laughs> once you've owned a few houses, you read a few books, you know, I try to learn as much as I can in finance. Um, I've been fortunate enough, you know, to make good money. And then, and, you know, I've seen other people take care of the money. I've seen other people lose money. You know, I know there's so many different things. So I figured like, if I have it, like I want to be interested in it. So I know what's going on and, 
you know, I might not be the smartest guy, but at least I know what's going on in all situations. Cause you never want to be one of those person that just rely too much on one person. And all of a sudden you get burnt. That's awesome. Uh, just switching back into the, the on ice portion, uh, Paul has you, uh, with Kyle Connor and Patrick line right now. What's it like to play with two guys like that, uh, as a person who is at the point in your career too, where you can sort of, you know, teach those guys a, th- a thing or two out there as well. Yeah, it's fun. I think, uh, at first, you know, like I, you try to play play the same way like them because it seems like they're just flying out there and having so much much fun. But then I, I come to realize like you know my game's not like that. Like to me, it, it's more about like stopping on the puck, trying to get that puck as quick as I can to those guys because those guys you know want their puck. You know once the puck's in their hands, like they can make plays. And then you know for me, it's more about like supporting those guys. But um, yeah, it's nice. I mean, you forget you forget sometimes you want to do too much and then you play with these guys and you realize you know if these guys have the puck and have that extra second of space, like they can do so much. So you realize like it doesn't have to be a special play with them for them. It's just about, it's about me getting that puck in their hands as quick as I can. And then, you know, supporting them and, and trying to find those, those spots that can either buy them time or, um, you know, give them a little, you know, extra second to get a shot off. I know it's only been a week of camp, but how have you seen their games grow since the last time you saw them a few years ago? Uh, I think just like anything, I think, you know, the love of the game, hasn't changed you know that's what you see with a lot of these young guys I think more than anything you just you know they've gotten a little faster they've gotten a little stronger they've matured a little bit but you forget how young they both are still so I think I'm I couldn't tell you how old Casey is was he 24 I think like so. Patty's 22 okay I don't, yeah so you just 2015 I mean, draft for him so he'd probably be yeah okay so you laugh because you're like oh these guys are so young and they have such I mean people have such high expectations where I mean when I was 22 I told Patty I was like I was just finishing my second year of the league. He's already got 300 games under his belt. You know, so it's, it's just so different. So, like, more more than anything, like, a lot of these guys now are so talented and skilled at a young age. And now it's just, like, you see the maturity kind of grow. You know, it's more like day in, day in, day in and day out activities. You see um, more like the mental side of things. That's where you try to teach them stuff where, you know, you just can't get too caught up in one game. Because too many times, you know, you put everything under a microscope and you think it's the end of the world if you have a bad game. But especially in a season like this, like, you know, no one cares. You got to flip the page because everything happens so fast. And, um, you know, it, it is filled with ups and downs, but that's just, you know, that's part of it. And the people that are most consistent are always the most successful ones. You were a guy, obviously, that played college hockey. How does the schedule in the college ranks compare to what you're about to face here? Do you, do you think you have any sort of idea of what you're in store for? Uh, no, I mean, I'm ready for it. I think uh, college was college was you know you play back-to-back games go out hard and then you know train and lift hard but i, I mean i always think college is more uh not it's different now i think when i was growing up i think college was like more for like early, late bloomers you know like where you weren't physically ready and you know you got to spend more time in the gym and everyone gets too caught up i think like you know juniors play way more games in college but i mean college you're still going hard you're playing back-to-back and you know you're you're getting you know, a lot physically a lot bigger, which helps you, you know, for the next season, if you do have an 82 game season, um, in a short season like this, I think, um, more than anything, I think it's just, you know, recovery is a big thing, but it's also, what's nice is, is if you are playing, if you're not traveling as much, you know, so sometimes like you play a two game season, travel a lot, or like here, if you're going to one spot, playing team two or three times and then flying like that, that helps, you know, that saves the buy a lot. Cause you're not flying or if you're at home for three or four games in a row, instead of being home for one flying for one home for one that's where like the wear and tear really gets on you so i don't know if i'm going to um you know throw myself under a bus here but i was doing some research on wikipedia which i know is the most reliable of sources uh it said you were one of the last guys in the nhl to use a wooden stick is that is that accurate yeah so what was it about the wooden stick that didn't you know you didn't want to switch uh i mean like uh I mean, that's what I just used my whole life. So I was just comfortable with it. I just, uh, at the time, like they're the most consistent, you know, I just, I just like the feel of it. I wasn't, I could have switched for, for different reasons, but then all of a sudden part of my game gets better and then part of my strengths get a lot weaker, you know, so that didn't, I didn't need to change. And then what happened is sometimes, I mean, you know, eventually you got to catch up with the times and, you know, slowly switch. So I really, I was comfortable with it. And then all of a sudden one year, um, my Sherwood sticks, which I use my whole life. like, I could tell like they're completely different and you know, it's hard to tell, but like if you've been using something your whole life and all of a sudden someone switches it, it's really easy to tell. Right. And, uh, 
I end up finding out like they changed factories. I don't know where they were made originally. Then they changed factories and I mean, they didn't tell me, but then I found out about it. And then that kind of pissed me off a little bit because no one said anything, but then I could just feel like they're, they're softer. They're just, they're made differently, you know? So yeah. then I actually, um, switched like Easton. Easton made me wood sticks. I think in 2010 when, you know, the Olympics there I had Easton wood sticks. And then that summer I kind of switched over and I tried all the one pieces. I actually tried like Easton Bauer warrior and sure would had one at the time. And I was like, no, I was kind of fed up with them actually. And I wouldn't, tr I wouldn't try their one piece and no one was using their one piece. And it actually wasn't until the end of the summer that I actually used it. I'm like, you know what? I actually like this. Cause it actually felt, it was like a lighter, you know, one piece. Is that the T90? I, maybe, but like, it actually felt like the wood, it actually felt like a wood stick yeah. to me. And I was like, oh, okay. I do like this. And then, you know, and then now the one pieces have developed so much where they can make them feel like bottom heavy, top heavy, more like a two piece, more like a, yeah. like a wood stick. So that's, now you can kind of tinker a lot more than you could back then. That's awesome. So my final question for you is one I'm, you know, going to canvas the entire team about what was your hobby during the pandemic aside from, you know, keeping up with the kids? Uh, I liked, um, I was doing like the Rosetta Stone. So I was like learning French again because oh, yeah. I, I grew up, I, I was born in Quebec, so I understand it well. I don't speak it too well. Then I took it in school for a couple of years. So there's more like, I don't want to lose the lingo. So I, I wanted to get back to that. And then I, like I said, during the whole, like I said, big finance guy. So I kind of like watch CNBC all day and I just, I love it and it drives my wife crazy. She's like, how can you watch this for like eight hours a day? But it's just, you know, it's like, it's like reading you're constantly learning and you're kindly absorbing, you know, new information. And then, and then reading, I, I'd, I'd watch some shows, but then I just tried reading too. And, um, I don't even know what I read in the bubble. I kind of switch genres because sometimes I'll read a history book. Sometimes I'll read kind of, like I said, a finance book. Something I learned. Sometimes I'll read an autobiography. I like to switch it up just because if I just do autobiography, you know, two, three, four in a row, they kind of get old. So it's like, right. you know, keep, keep myself guessing a little bit, but um, yeah, it was basically a lot of that. And then if I'd watch the hockey games, I would probably kind of watch it on mute. Like that's the thing I do too. I don't like listening to commentators too much just cause <laughs> you know, good or bad. And sometimes it drives me crazy. Sometimes like it's good to learn, but it's good to watch the game. So then, you know, there's three games on a day. So yeah. you're kind of watching it, but, um, I didn't really go to too many games in the bubble just cause, uh, it was freezing in there, you know, and on watching on TV actually felt a lot better. Like if you're on the ice, it felt fine. If you're watching on TV, it felt fine. If you actually watch in the stands then it just felt really awkward. It was you, strange. Yeah. There. You feel like you could hear everything and it's just like, all right, this just doesn't have the same feel to it, but uh, yeah, I may do. And like I said, everyone kind of comp everyone complains about the bowl afterwards. But when you're in it, you forget about like what you don't have, and you just kind of appreciate what you do have. And then you know you're playing every other day. Time kind of flies by, and then I think when you're done, you're like, oh wow, that was that was a long two months. And it's, it's <laughs> yeah. good to be home, good to be like outside in the sun and kind of just doing other things. Well, you guys were there a heck of a lot longer than we were. Uh, Paul, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Shop where the players shop. Jets Gear and TrueNorthShop.com are your authentic team stores. Make sure to stock up on all your favorite Winnipeg Jets and Manitoba Moose merchandise today. Visit one of the five Jets Gear locations or shop online at TrueNorthShop.com. Thanks to Paul Stasny for the time this afternoon. Uh, moving into the World Juniors, uh, Mitch Cole Perfetti uh, ends up with a silver medal around his neck. Nothing to be ashamed of, obviously, but not the the medal that he wanted. Vili Hanala uh, has the, the the bronze medal uh, as well. So both Jets prospects, including Henry Nikonen as well, uh, earning medals. Uh, just your thoughts on the way the tournament shook out for the the three Jets? Yeah, I mean, we'll start with with Cole Perfetti uh, with Canada. I mean, I think for him it was he was 18 he turned 19 during that event there's a lot of 19 year olds that uh that play in that tournament so for a guy that's really getting his first i guess you could say taste of the world juniors he was one of the last cuts uh the previous year i thought he did well i mean especially you know kirby doc goes down which was a big loss for canada um and all of a sudden your your lineup is all over the all over the map so perfetti played wing with with a number of different centers um, I thought he got better as the tournament went on and seemed to get more and more comfortable and confident. I mean, you could see on the power play, he's got incredible vision. And as the tournament went on, it seemed to be more of a priority for Canada to get pucks to the net a little bit more. And I thought once that mindset kind of took over, that's when Perfetti really showed what he, what he's capable of doing um, from that half wall spot. So I thought, you know, he, he ended with uh, a couple of goals, obviously a big one in the semifinal against Russia 
um, and uh, some assists as well. So I thought I thought he did uh, quite well and showed well for himself. Billy Hainala was an absolute monster for Finland. <laughs> like, you know, it, it was unfortunate for him that in the New Year's Eve game that uh, he blocked a shot off his hand and then had to miss the rest of the game. But all he did was two nights later come back out and play 28 minutes in the quarterfinal against Sweden, then another near 28 minute performance in the semifinal and played uh, nearly 25 in the bronze and was just a fantastic defenseman for Finland. Top three uh, player on the team, which is voted on by the coaches. He made the tournament all star team. I mean, you're Billy Hainala. That's the kind of performance that you wanted to have at the World Juniors. And this is really the first time I had a chance to watch Henry Nikonen and he was impressive. I mean, big body center that was uh, kind of a net front presence on the power play for for Finland's second unit. And you look at the quarterfinal, when they came back against Sweden, he scored a massive goal for Finland, uh, finishing off a rush to start that comeback. Uh, so he played a, a big role for uh, Finland in the medal round as well. So, I mean, in terms of experience for those three Jets prospects, I mean... You'd love for for one of them to be able to to win gold, but I mean, for all three of them to come home with a medal, that's uh, some pretty solid plan. Yeah, absolutely, and I would agree with you there. You looked at that gold medal game, even though the the result wasn't what Canada wanted. Cole Perfetti stood out quite a bit in that game, and he was on the ice in the final minute, and and that's all you can really ask for if you're a player of his caliber. Paul, ending things off with a Jets note. You know, Connor Hellebuck, he comes off winning the Vesna last year. Um, a bit of a different season ahead of him in terms of workload and the schedule. But, you know, how else uh, would Connor Hellebuck handle this? He says he wants to play 40 plus games this season. Uh, you know, what do you make of his comments and, and how do you see the goaltending situation shaking out? I mean, Lauren Bressois has looked very sharp in camp so far. I think if you're the Winnipeg Jets and head coach Paul Maurice, you got to be happy from what you've seen from your, your net minders thus far. Well, there's no doubt when you're in a 56 unique game schedule, you're going to ride your number one guy. You have to, right? He's a reigning Vezina Trophy winner. He's the highest paid goaltender on the team by a large margin. He wants to have that workload. And now it's just load management, okay? What do you want him to do? When do you want him to play? They'll make sure that they give him enough warning when there's going to be a day off. They want to keep him in rhythm. Paul Maurice has always said the priority of goaltenders is the number one guy. Then the backup guy will usually come in for some mop-up or some scraps. It's just the nature of the role. But I think that you're going to actually have Lauren Brossois play a significant role this year. One thing in goaltending, now I know it's 56 games, but let's just extrapolate that over the 82-game schedule that we've seen in the past, at least in the last couple of years. There has been a move to reduce the workload on number one guys by five or so games and allow the backups to take those games from them in order to have a little bit more in the tank and some readiness and sharpness when you get into the playoffs. Reducing the workload, I think, really helps the number one goaltender prepare for the real season when that begins. And so I think that what they're going to do is look at Connor Hellebuck to take the lion's share of games. There's no doubt about it. He'll have the bulk of them. You need him to go but it's going to be incumbent on Lauren Brossois to be sharp. And he has been sharp in camp for sure. I think he's prepared himself now to not only be real good at that backup role for the third straight year in Winnipeg, but maybe after this contract, ascend himself into maybe more of a role somewhere else perhaps, or still in Winnipeg to play a few more games or the desire is always to be a number one goaltender, perhaps somewhere else. So how does it shake down to be a little bit more succinct? Connor Hellebach will play the majority of games. It will be really up to him on how many he plays and how he feels. Shot velocity, certainly certainly shot volumes, all of that will come into play as well. And on back-to-back games, like the schedule we'll have a lot of, you will not see Connor Hellebach. Albeit, when you are in a scenario when you're staying in the same spot and you're not traveling, it's a little bit easier to go back-to-back. But look for Lauren Brossois to take the back end of those back-to-backs. Those will be his games. But you'll see 40 to 45 games from Connor Hellebuck of the 56, I'm sure. Gentlemen, how happy are you guys to be back inside an arena covering hockey? It's the best. <laughs> I am. I'm ecstatic. This, is, this has been great. It's been a fabulous first week of training camp for the Winnipeg Jets. 
there's been a lot that's been exposed. I don't think there's been a lot of secrets as to who's going to make the team. I think we have a pretty good idea of the makeup of the team. There are questions like you asked earlier, Tyler, about the taxi squad and maybe who's going to be that 13th forward or that 7th defenseman. Sammy Niku, where does he fit in? So these are questions, but these are great. There's not any more speculation. We're, we're seeing it unfold. And the way that they've skated this week and the things that they've worked on and it was skating and, and getting puck touches early on. And then there was some battle drills and then there's some special teams work that's filtered in. And now you're seeing more systematic work being exemplified by the coaching staff wanting to get the players ready. So there'll be another notch coming up in the second week of training camp before you get to that first game on the 14th. But it's been so refreshing to be able to talk and watch hockey and not just sort of speculate on when a season might start. Well, the pace has been noticeable at NHL Jets camp, and the pace has been quite uh, noticeable here. Uh, this episode has flown by. Uh, boys, thank you so much for your time. On behalf of myself, Tyler Esquivel, Mitchell Clinton, and Paul Edmonds, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. This is Big Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. For Jets news, videos, and more, head to winnipegjets.com. 